Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds. We thank Almighty God Allah for blessing us, the black man and the black woman of America, with a divine leader, a divine teacher, and a divine guide in the personage of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, the messenger of Almighty God Allah. My beloved brothers and sisters, we are thankful to Almighty God Allah for this great afternoon. We thank Him for holding back the rains. Even though He made it a little cool, He made it just right. For if the sun had shone and it had been a warm day, we might have had a catastrophe out here on Randall's Island for it looked like the world was coming to this black family day. We thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad through whom all of this has been made possible. My brothers and sisters, I have a very serious message for you this afternoon. And while we are here to purchase whatever the black merchants have to sell, while we are here to listen to the wonderful music of our great brothers and sisters, and while we are here to enjoy the spirit of family, I must warn you that a very serious day is on the horizon for the United States of America and a very serious day for the black man and woman in America. And this is why we have called this a Black Family Day. Because unless the black people in America feel that sense of family, Unless we, brothers and sisters, old and young, rich and poor, educated and uneducated, feel that spirit of brotherhood and family, all of us will suffer a great catastrophe in the next few years. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants you and me to know and understand that every black brother and sister is flesh of each other's flesh and blood of each other's blood and bone of each other's bone. I don't care where you come from, brother. If you come from Georgia, if you come from Mississippi, if you come from Louisiana or Tennessee or New York State or California, all of us are brothers. If you come from Trinidad, if you come from Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, Nicaragua, Puerto Rico, Panama, Guatemala, all of us, wherever you find us, we are brothers. If we are from Africa, from the Isles of the Pacific, we are brothers. For the last 6,000 years, we have been divided up into tribes, and each tribe has been played off one against the other. In Africa, we suffer from tribalism. In Africa today, the wise leadership in Africa wants to break up tribalism and make black Africa realize that all Africa is one. In America, we suffer from the same. We have many different organizations, many different leaders, but all of us want the same thing. There's not one of us here who doesn't want freedom. There's not one of us here who does not want justice and equality. There's not one of us here who doesn't want to see the black man lifted up from the mud of white civilization. But there are many different roads that we have chosen to take. Some of us have chosen to march. Others have chosen to picket. Some have chosen to demonstrate. Some have picked up the gun. But today, all of the black leadership that rose up in the last 10 years has died down. And every black organization that stood up for black people has died down. And one great leader and one great group 
is now emerging on the black scene for the whole of black America to look at. And that leader that is emerging today for all black America to look at is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Muhammad has taught us that in the birth of a nation, it's like the birth of a baby. First, the baby must be conceived in the darkness of the womb. And as it begins to form, the head must form first. If the head is not formed first, the body cannot come. Therefore, the largest part of the sperm is the head of it. And as that sperm meets the egg, the first thing that forms is the head, and it is the largest part of that embryo. And as it grows into the fetus and begins to develop in that tiny dark house called the womb, the feet are at the opening and the head is up in an opposite position. But if you notice, just before the birth of the baby, there is a show of blood. And then a turn takes place. The feet that were at the opening turn up and the head turns down for the head must forge the way to freedom for that new life. And so it is with the birth of a people. Black brothers and sisters, we are about to come to birth as a new black nation. In the wilderness of North America, 30 million black people about to come to birth and the feet have been where the head should be meaning there have been people who claim to be leaders but they really were foot soldiers and the head was buried in a position that it couldn't make itself manifest but in the final hours just before the baby is about to be born all of the feet have now taken their turn and the true head has taken his turn and now Elijah Muhammad has come to the front. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the boldest, the wisest, the bravest black man ever to tread the shores of America stands in America single-handedly alone by the power of Almighty God Allah, raising up a dead nation to life. Look around, brothers and sisters. Look at your flag flying on 34 poles, the greatest universe flag, the sun, the moon, and the star. Look around you and look at your brothers and sisters. Nobody smoking. Nobody drunk. Everyone in the spirit of love and brotherhood with one another. This is the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He is not satisfied that just a few of us love each other. We will never rest until every black man, woman and child in America recognizes the fact that all of us are but one family. And until we love each other as a family, there can be no family. Now, brothers and sisters, let's mellow it right on down and talk to you. We are a family. There can be no family without a mother. There can be no mother without a woman. Elijah Muhammad is the only black man in America teaching the love the respect and the protection of the black woman in America. Here in this stadium, there are many black women, black women who have suffered in America from the white man and now suffer at the hands of the black man. The black woman must be liberated. She must be liberated from the cruel hand of the enemy and she must be liberated from the ignorant control of an ignorant man. Understand this, black brother. We cannot have a good family until we have a wise, intelligent black woman. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that where there are no decent women, there are no decent men. 
for the woman is the mother of civilization. As a tree is known by the fruit it bears, the intelligence of a nation is seen in the children that a woman produces. If you got a foolish woman, you got a foolish child. If you got a wise woman, she will produce for you a wise child. Therefore, it behooves us all to take another look at this black woman. Look at a real good black brother. Because without the woman, Muhammad says, we have no link with tomorrow. There is no tomorrow for the black man without a black woman. So when you hold a black woman, you're holding on to tomorrow. When you treat a black woman right, you're treating tomorrow right. When you protect a black woman, you are protecting your tomorrow. For every black woman represents your future. Think about it, brothers and sisters. How can there be a good black woman if there's not a good, strong black man to keep her good? The role Muhammad teaches us of the black man is that the black man must be a provider. He must be a maintainer. He must secure and protect the black woman. A black man who will not work is a black man who is a drag to the black family. A black man who only knows how to make a baby but does not know how to protect that child, who does not want to feed and secure that child, is an enemy to the rise of the black man. I want you to understand it. I want to talk to you, brother. And I want my brothers to listen. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants you to know, brother, that all of these little children that are here today, that is our family. Your son is my son. And my son is your son. And until you and I learn to love our children enough to want to protect them with our life blood, then we can never be respected as a people. Black brothers and sisters, there is no need for us to beg the white man for a job. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, as long as there's life in us, we can make jobs for ourselves. And this is what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been doing all over America. Elijah Muhammad is the only black man in America building schools for black people. Every other person is picketing to make the white man's school right. While Elijah Muhammad gets us together, pools our nickels, dimes and dollars and builds universities of Islam. In 46 cities in America, there you will find a Muhammad University of Islam. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has caused us to buy farmland in Georgia, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Michigan. For what? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, until the black man learns to take his mouth out of the white man's kitchen, we will never be free. My young revolutionary brother, how long can you fight a revolution without food? How long can you sustain your struggle for liberation without grits on your table? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, he who controls your food can control your revolution. He who controls your food can stop your march toward liberation. One man in the Bible sold his heritage, sold his birthright for a mess of porridge. You will sell your right to liberation when you get hungry. If Whitey has a bowl of soup to offer you, you'll give up the struggle. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to the black man, if we want to be free, we've got to feed ourselves. We've got to clothe ourselves. We have got to shelter ourselves. Brothers and sisters, while we are here at this Black Family Day Bazaar, planning good for one another, the white man in Washington, D.C., 
is planning evil for the entire black nation. I want you to listen, brothers and sisters. There has never been a black leader to rise up in America for your and my good that white people did not destroy or try to get you and me to destroy. Marcus Garvey was one of the greatest black men of our time. Marcus Garvey came to America from the island of Jamaica. He came with an idea in mind for the freedom of black people. He wanted us to stop calling ourselves colored. He wanted us to remember that we were black. And he wanted us to look toward Africa as the place, the birthplace of the black man and for the future of the black man. But white people felt threatened by the presence of Marcus Garvey. The government of America felt threatened by the presence of Marcus Garvey. So they planned to destroy Mr. Garvey. And how did they do it, brothers and sisters? They planned infiltrators inside of Marcus Garvey's movement. Meanwhile, the press went to work calling Marcus Garvey a racist, a man who wanted to put black against white. I want you to think about this. Meanwhile, Mr. Garvey started the Black Star Line, if you remember. Whites didn't want to sell Marcus Garvey a ship. They called him a faker. Then they finally accused him of using the mails to defraud the people. This was a trick to get black people to lose their love, their sympathy, and their respect for the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And they succeeded. Finally, they jailed Mr. Garvey and then deported him. And inside his movement, they put brother against brother. Fist fights began to break out between rebel elements of the UNIA. And all of a sudden, Marcus Garvey's movement disappeared from the scene. And a great black man and his great black movement was crushed. And white America went on as usual to deceive the black man. Now that Marcus Garvey is dead, now that he can no longer do any good for living black people, now the truth can come out that Marcus Garvey was a good man. Marcus Garvey was a great man. But it's too late. Marcus Garvey is dead and gone. Do you remember Adam Clayton Powell? Was he a good man for black people? Did he work hard for black people? Yes, he did. But in Washington, they decided that Adam Clayton Powell was getting too much power. So they wanted to lynch Adam Clayton Powell politically. But they couldn't lynch Adam Clayton Powell until they had isolated Powell from the people of Harlem. How did they do it? Adam Clayton Powell would go on what they call junkets around the world. And then they would put it on the front page of the paper, Adam Clayton Powell seen in this place or that place with his shapely secretary. What were they trying to put into your mind and mine? That Adam Clayton Powell was a playboy. That Adam Clayton Powell was a great lover. Well, what about the President of the United States? What about the freakish members of the Congress? What about all of these freaks that are in the government? Why would you pick on Adam Clayton Powell? Adam Clayton Powell didn't tell you he was Jesus. He told you he was a brother of yours that wanted to do good for black people. But once they had isolated us from Adam Clayton Powell and used some words that he allegedly said of some black woman that she was a bad woman, they used that to politically crucify the man. Then they castrated him while we stood idly by just looking. And it was only after Adam Clayton Powell was dead, then you and I said, you know something? Clayton Powell sure was a great man. How come we can't recognize the greatness of men while they live? How come we have to wait until a man is dead and gone before we recognize what kind of man we have? 
All my beloved black brothers and sisters, I appeal to you this afternoon to reason. Look at Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver. Many of you love the Panther philosophy. You love to see a young black brother stand up and challenge the system. They were beautiful brothers, beautiful men who wanted liberation for black people. But whitey there again infiltrated the Panther movement. And while many of the brothers and sisters were saying, right on, right on baby, right on, in the crowd was an agent of the United States government planning the destruction of the Panther Party. You live to see him put Huey and Eldridge against one another, bust the movement down the middle, and then break it up. And now, and now they can talk about the Panther Party because they destroyed it. Now they can talk about Corn Snake because they destroyed it. Now they can talk about Rap Brown because my beautiful black brother is in prison. And now they can talk about Stokely Carmichael because Stokely is out of the picture. But oh, there's a black man in America who has been in the picture for 40 years. There's a black man in America that time has not destroyed. There's a black man in America who was here in the 30s, here in the 40s, here in the 50s, here in the 60s, and now in the 70s, Elijah Muhammad is still on the scene and still going strong. What has made Elijah Muhammad survive? What has caused Elijah Muhammad to maneuver through the mountains of hate and propaganda? Don't you remember when they said we taught hate? Don't you remember when they said we were violent? Don't you remember when they said we were anti-white and anti-Christian? And don't you remember when you didn't want nothing to do with a Muslim? Don't you remember? Don't you remember the time when you wouldn't be caught dead at anything given by a Muslim? Don't you remember? Oh, don't act like you don't remember. Because it wasn't that long ago. Just a few years ago, he has seated before me our ambassadors from the United Nations. He has seated before me our scholars and scientists, educated people who would never come near Elijah Muhammad. I ask you, what brought about a change in you? What made you come here this afternoon? It is because Elijah Muhammad has skillfully guided his followers through the maze of confusion and propaganda. Elijah Muhammad, with wisdom, never took up the gun. He told his followers, don't carry so much as a pen knife. He said, do like I tell you and you will be successful. Elijah Muhammad took the dope needle out of our arm. Elijah Muhammad took the wine bottle out of our hand. Elijah Muhammad stopped us from throwing away our money on horse racing and gambling. And he told us, pool that money, brother. Pool that money, sister, and let's do constructive things. So now that all of the other black groups and organizations have been destroyed by white power, by white deceit, by white chicanery coming out of Washington, D.C. Now there is only one leader left. There's only one group left. And that one leader and that one group represents the hope of the black man of America. Never could you go anywhere and see black people so disciplined. Never have you gone anywhere and seen black people so in control of themselves. Look at the stillness. Look at the quiet, look at the discipline, look at the beauty. And all of this is brought about by a hated and a feared black man. A black man whom the white man would want to see dead. And as I talk to you right now in the chambers of Washington, D.C., they're planning the destruction of the nation of Islam. And I want to tell you how they plan to go about it. So if and when it takes place, you will not be in the dark. You will understand, and you'll be able to get around the plan, around the trap, around the snare put before us by our shrewd enemies. Listen, do you remember a few years ago the Libyan government 
loaned the nation of Islam three million dollars. The Libyan government in Africa, headed up by Colonel Gaddafi, a very brilliant young Muslim, a very stern, strong Muslim, he loved the work of Elijah Muhammad. And his government loaned the nation of Islam three million dollars, asking for no collateral and seeking no interest. I say this to you, beloved brothers and sisters, white people have always strove to keep wealth and wisdom far apart where black people are concerned. For the marriage of wealth and wisdom equals power. Now, if you got a man that's wise, keep him poor, and the wisdom that he has will never be able to come into reality. And if you've got a man that's rich, keep him dumb so that you can siphon off his riches so that his wealth will never aid his people. And so either we have come up rich and dumb or wise and poor, but never have the two been merged. Do you understand? Look at all of the black entertainers, the black prize fighters, the black people who have garnered tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. How did they die? They died broke. Look at all the talented black people who could sing, who could dance, who could play instruments. Their managers live wealthy while the talented ones the gifted ones died broke with needles in the arm. Have you noticed that when black people had wisdom, like Marcus Garvey, like Noble Ju Ali, like those great black warriors of the present day, keep money from them so that their ideas can never be translated into reality. Here's a black man named Elijah Muhammad, supremely wise. Do you remember when Muhammad Ali stood up one day and said, I am a Muslim follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Almost immediately, the New York Times, that racist, evil, wicked newspaper, began to lambaste Muhammad Ali. Why did they do that? Because Muhammad Ali, heavyweight champion of the world, a man who garners millions of dollars. They did not want any of that money to be united with the wisdom of Elijah Muhammad. So they wanted to make you think that Muhammad Ali was a fool. He had joined the Muslims and now Muhammad was taking all of Muhammad Ali's money. You remember that? They want to make you think that everybody that joins the Muslims, the Muslims take all their money from them. How can the Muslims take from you what you don't have? When we came to Muhammad, we came broke. We came ragged. We came hungry. And we came out of doors. But look at the way Muhammad teaches us. Now we look well. We eat well. We sleep well. We ride well. We fly well. Because we got a good teacher. A teacher who's not trying to rob the black man but a teacher was trying to put money in the black man's pocket. Now let's go back to Libya. I want you to listen. Everybody comfortable? Let's go back to Libya. Three million dollars loaned to Elijah Muhammad and the nation of Islam. How do you think the United States government accepted that? They didn't go for that at all. You know why? Elijah Muhammad, in his head, has a fountain of living wisdom. In the Middle East, there's a fountain of living oil that brings up unlimited wealth. And if you match the unlimited wealth of the Middle East with the unlimited wisdom of Elijah Muhammad in the West, you've got enough power there to raise black people up all the way around the world. Now, listen to what the government decided to do. The government rose up a man in Washington, D.C. to speak evil words against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This was done in the city of New Orleans in the 1920s against Marcus Garvey. 
and the man that spoke out against Marcus Garvey was murdered. And after the man was murdered, Marcus Garvey was charged as being the perpetrator of the crime. I want you to see the pattern of white people. The names and the faces have changed, but the game is still the same. Understand it, brothers and sisters. Now, in Washington, D.C., here were some Hanafi Muslims. Seven of them murdered women and children. What man in his right mind over some silly statement of a foolish man would go and murder a man's women and children? That's a very bizarre, that's a very ugly and fiendish act, isn't it? But it was done, wasn't it? And then that wicked newspaper, the New York Times, with a Negro stool pigeon puppet called Paul Delaney, then the next day it was said that the black Muslims murdered that family. Now what was that designed to do? Let me tell you, huh? That was designed to take the Sunni Muslims, the Orthodox Muslim community, and the black Muslim followers of Elijah Muhammad and cause us to go to war with each other. Right after that, there was a break-in in a sporting goods store in Brooklyn, if you remember. And some Sunni Muslim brothers of ours were charged with breaking in to get guns to start a war with the followers of Elijah Muhammad. All of this was rumor, but this was designed to put brother against brother. Just like the white man did in the Congo, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Nigeria, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Ghana, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Vietnam, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Korea, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Cuba, he put brother against brother. Just like he did in Chile, in Peru, in Colombia, in Nicaragua, he put brother against brother. Look at it now. He plants the seed of evil and then withdraws his slimy hand, puts it behind his back as though he did nothing, and then he puts it in his paper. Look at how they're fighting each other. Look at how they're killing each other. They're not ready for independence. They're not ready for freedom. Are you wise to the trick, brothers and sisters? Then after he was not successful in getting the Sunni Muslims and the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to go to war with each other, which we will never do, he put it around the world in the Muslim community in the Middle East and in Africa that we had murdered seven Orthodox Muslims. This was a trick by the United States government to stop any money from coming from the Muslim world to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to do his work in America of uplifting 30 million black people. Now, brothers and sisters, they have not stopped. On the west coast of America, have you been reading about these zebra murders? Twelve white people were gunned down or killed in some fashion. Big deal. I mean, what is, what are twelve white lives? God is not after twelve of them. No, he's not after twelve. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that he's after all. And so 12 living or dead is not going to stop their movement or their progress. No, we are not that kind of people. And the white people know it. The mayor of San Francisco knows it. The governor of the state of California knows it. But now, why was that laid to the foot of the Muslims? You have to question these things, brothers and sisters, because the enemy is on the move to break up the family. Listen, listen, listen. 
What did he do that for? How many of you remember reading about Jesus in the scripture? Pardon me for using scripture, but we all know it, so why not use it? Don't you remember that Herod wanted to kill Jesus before Jesus was born? Now that man was such an evil killer that he didn't want Jesus to live. He wanted to kill him at birth, so they kept looking for the mother Mary. Since they couldn't find Mary, Jesus was born. And since Mary was a wise girl and the father of Jesus was a wise man, they got Jesus out of Palestine into Egypt so he could grow up in wisdom to come back to Palestine to complete his work. When Jesus was of age, he came back to Palestine fully grown. And now Herod had to deal with a man, no longer a baby. And here was a man teaching something that Herod could not condemn. But I want to show you something. Every time Jesus opened the blind man's eyes, every time Jesus made a deaf man hear, every time Jesus made a dumb man speak, every time Jesus cleansed the leper, made a lame man whole and healed a withered hand and raised a dead man to life, coming behind Jesus were the Pharisees and the scribes. And they would be saying, look here, you see what Jesus did? I know you think that Jesus is a good man, don't you? But you know something? That Jesus is doing all of this by the power of the devil. They were interpreting Jesus' good work to make the people even look at good and think good was evil. Pretty soon, Jesus had become so popular that the people would come in multitudes to hear of the work of Jesus. When they heard that Jesus was coming, they would come in droves by the thousands and they would gather by the Sea of Galilee to see Him work His miracles. Meanwhile, in Herod's house, the boys were talking. They said, we got to get rid of Jesus. But how are we going to do it? The people love Him. How are we going to get rid of this man? The people are flowing to Jesus. So they hatched the plot. They said, the first thing we got to do is make Jesus look like a criminal. Make all his followers look like they're criminals. Then when we can get all of Jesus' followers to look like criminals, then we can come down on them and the people won't even cry out. First, they got a turncoat in Judas to deliver up the master for 30 pieces of silver. And then they accused Jesus of being a wrongdoer and Pontius Pilate washed his hands of the matter saying he knew he was a good man but I have to get him because Herod wants him out of the way I gotta get him because he's doing too much and if these people listen to Jesus pretty soon we won't have no control over them and so they brought Jesus out and had all the people believe that he was a no good man and before long, the same people that said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, they were the same people saying, Crucify! Crucify! And after they murdered him, then they put up a sign for all of us to worship, Jesus saved. He didn't save himself, and he didn't save his disciples. I want you to listen, black brothers and sisters, because I'm not talking to you about a Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago. I'm not talking to you about something that happened in the Roman Empire. I'm telling you about a modern Rome. And that modern Rome is the United States of America. I'm telling you about a modern Egypt, more wicked than ancient Egypt. I'm telling you about a modern Babylon, more corrupt than ancient Babylon. I'm telling you about a modern Sodom and Gomorrah, more freakish than ancient Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the Rome. And in the midst of you, you Mary, black man, is like a virgin. You have never known a man that would breathe into you the seed of truth that you could come forth with a new life. So you are a virgin that God has come under the cover of darkness and made the virgin pregnant with a child. 
And that child is to be known as the Son of God or the Messenger of Almighty God Allah. And out of the midst of you now is a man named Elijah Muhammad. They wanted to kill him at birth. They tried to destroy him in Detroit. They tried to destroy him in Chicago. They jailed him in Washington. They broke up his movement. But Elijah Muhammad came roaring back. And because they didn't kill him, now he's stronger than ever. And everywhere you look, you see a Muhammad's temple. Everywhere you look in every major city in America, you see followers of Elijah Muhammad. In all of the prisons of America, there you find Muslims. Everywhere today, people are pulsating under the rhythmic beat of Elijah Muhammad's message. You may not be in the temple. You may not belong to the nation of Islam, but all of you will agree that the white man is a devil. And not one of you who do disagree that the hell that has been raised all over the earth has not been raised by a spirit. The hell in Africa was raised by a real devil. The hell in Asia, in South America, has been raised by a real devil, a flesh and blood devil. And we, the black people of America, were brought out of our native land and people over 400 years ago, not by a friend, not by an angel, but by a devil. And he brought us to America not to make us citizens, but to make us slaves. And Messenger Muhammad teaches us how he robbed us of our names and gave us his name. And now you are Johnson. You're Jones and Culpepper and O'Reilly and Underbrook and Overhill and Understreet and Bunch and Powell and Muddy Waters and Clear Waters and beside the still water. But you're not yourself. You don't speak your language anymore. You speak the white man's language. You don't worship your God anymore. You worship the God that the white man taught you to worship. You don't salute your flag anymore. You salute the flag that the white man gave you to salute. You don't fight for yourself anymore. You fight for your enemy. You don't fight for your liberation anymore. You fight for his. And so, my beloved, beautiful black brothers and sisters, the Bible says of us, we got eyes, but we can't see. We have ears, but we can't hear. We've got a tongue, but we can't speak. We're living men, but we're dead mentally. Listen, we have leprosy of the mind. We have white-mindedness. We are lame. You know how we walk? What's that? At the walk of a lame man. What made him lame? He lame in the head. The Bible said he had paralysis. You know, when a man got paralysis, you see his hands look like this. Poor black man's hands look like they're tied to his body. He got hands, but they don't build for black self. Ants build homes. Birds build nests. Everybody doing something for themselves while the black man... But reach your hand out to us as a brother as we reach our hand out to you as a brother and let's unite the black families. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings is causing the black man to hear, the black man to speak, the black man to use his hands, the black man to use his feet, the black man is standing up all over America. And everywhere you go, though you may not agree in totality with Elijah Muhammad, you like what the man is doing. You say it like this. You say, well, I don't dig no religion. I'm not too up on no religion, man. I can understand how you feel. But you don't understand Islam. Actually, the Holy Quran teaches us Islam is not really a religion. Islam is the nature in which Allah created us. It's natural. It's not something contrived. When you live according to your natural self, you're living Islam. So anyway, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, doing all of this good for the black man, here comes Whitey to interpret what he does. You notice how he's cleaning up these junkies? He's cleaning up these convicts, then white folks come and say, yeah, well, he's cleaning them up because he wants to set up a gang of thieves. 
a gang of, you know, murderers and things. Do you notice this, brother? Every time the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sets up a farm, sets up a factory, sets up a school, they say, you see that? You see what he's doing? This is black capitalism. In all these college campuses, they are interpreting Elijah Muhammad's work for you. What is black capitalism? If it's black men exploiting black men, it is no good. We don't want it, and that's not what Elijah Muhammad is. But as long as you think like that, you will never view the positive works of Elijah Muhammad with admiration and love. And now that white folks can't stop you from admiring Muhammad, now that they can't stop you from coming to Muhammad, their aim is to destroy the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And now they want to paint the picture throughout America that we are criminals, that we are convicts and thieves and murderers. As long as you look at us like that, when the police come with their guns drawn to end the nation of Islam, then you will stand idly by and say, well, at last they got rid of those people. And this is the stage that white America is setting right now. The government of America is the number one enemy. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad went to Peru and brought fish from the Peruvian government, bringing it in by the millions of pounds to sell it to you at lower the price so that you could eat and feed your family. And we could gain the nickels and dimes from that fish to set up more schools and buy apartment buildings, clean them up and lower the rent for you to live in and enjoy. But when the white people saw what the Muslims were doing with that fish, the Secretary of State of the United States of America, a man that's running all over the world trying to get peace between the Arabs and the Jews, sent a letter to his embassy in Peru wanting to question the Peruvian government as to why they're selling fish to the nation of Islam. Every step that Elijah Muhammad takes for the good of the black man in America, the white man, especially the government of America, follows it up, trying to undermine his work. You who are here from Trinidad, you who are here from Jamaica, you who are here from the Arab countries, be warned that what Elijah Muhammad is doing is for the good of all men. But in order for them to destroy Muhammad, they want to isolate him from your friendship. They want to put fear into you. And they have been successful in putting fear into many of you. But think about that, the Secretary of State. You know who that is. The man that goes around kissing everybody. He doesn't want the government of Peru to sell fish to black people in America. A government tumbling down, but they are not too weak that they can't try to stop the progress of the nation of Islam. Well, my beloved black brothers and sisters, it is time for the family to unite. It is time for all of us to recognize the greatness of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And whether you agree with him in part or totally, we know that he's the only black man doing good things for black people. And we should pull together now in unity behind this great and noble leader, the most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. For he is opening the eyes of the blind. He's making the dumb speak, the deaf hear, the lame walk. He's cleansing the leprous white minds of black people. And so as I leave you, black brothers and sisters, I say that we can have no family unless we love each other. It is no crime for the black man to love himself and to love his brother as he loves himself. To every one of you that are under the sound of our voice, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants you to love your black self and to love your brother as you love yourself. Put that gun down for your black self. The white man will give you a gun, but he knows you're not going to shoot him. Every day we're sending each other to the hospital. Go to the Harlem Hospital and see how many of us we send in there on the weekend. It's not the white police officer, nor the black one who's killing us. 
as much as we are killing ourselves. Why are we doing this? Because the family has no love for one another. Black family, let's get it together. Black family, let's love each other. Black family, let's do good by one another. And never let it be said again by the northern brother. The brother that's born in the north. He said, oh, here come country. Dig that homie over there, you know what I mean? That dude from Georgia, he ain't got it together. Don't talk like that. All of us came by way of the South. You just in the North for another reason. But that brother in the South is your brother. The brother on the farm is your brother. The brother on the mule is your brother. The brother behind the tract is your brother. The brother on the chain gang is your brother. We are brothers, flesh of each other's flesh. Don't let the brother from America say to the brother from the West Indies, Look, man, what you got that West Indian out there for? It ain't nothing but a jive monkey chaser. <laughs> don't talk like that. And the brother from the West Indies, don't you say, Listen, man, I don't know why these American black people can't get the thing together. I don't know why all you can't get your thing together. Don't talk like that, brother. And you from the West Indies. Don't say, you know, I'm from Trinidad. And all us Trinidadians, you know, we have the best in the West Indies. And then the brother from Jamaica says, stop your talk. Stop your talk. We in Jamaica are the best of all, you know. And then the brother from Barbados says, shut your mouth. I got better and I got it all together. Don't talk like that. No, we are all one family. We are all one family. The brother in Puerto Rico, my Spanish-speaking brother. Oh, what a beautiful brother you are. But we are all brothers. Don't let the Spanish-speaking brother be at war with the English-speaking brother and be at war with the French-speaking brother. For none of you are Spanish and none of you are English. And none of you in Haiti, in Guadeloupe, and Martinique are French. That's the conqueror. He went in, he was Spanish. He called you Cesar Romero. He gave you his language. He gave you his culture. Then he went to Barbados and called him Henry Fitzsimmons. And then Fitzsimmons think that Cesar Romero is not his brother. And then Fitzsimmons think that the black man from Georgia is not his brother. Then Francois Chancy from Haiti or Martinique, he is a great revolutionary. And we in Haiti are the best of all. Stop that foolishness. We are all one family. Whether you're in Costa Rica, whether you're in black Africa, whether we're in the Isles of the Pacific, anywhere you see a black man, that is your brother. Anywhere you see a black woman, that is your sister. Anywhere a black man is in trouble, we all are in trouble. Understand, this is Black Family Day. Black man, brown man, yellow man, red man, we are brothers. It's the white man that's the odd fellow. So let's get the family together. Let's work for the family. Let's keep the family strong by keeping the tie of love strong in the family. All those of you who are rich, use your riches to elevate the poor. All those of you who think you are wise, use your wisdom to teach the unlearned so that all of us can walk together like brothers. And I say this, there is no family without a head of that family. There is no family without a father in that house. And I'm proud to say that the father of the black family, the man who's pulling the house together, the man who's making black man love black man, black man love brown man, black man love yellow man, black man love red man, the man who's making us all to feel that sense of family. That is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the father of 
love the black family. Can I say this? If you want a black family, put Muhammad as the head of it. Put his name up in your house. Take the white Jesus down off the wall. Jesus was not white, he was black. Get him down off the wall and put a black man up on your wall. Take all those statues out of your house. Don't bow down to no stone. Don't bow down to a statue. Remember that God is a man and we are men. And when men are in unity, men make things happen. Spirits can't make nothing happen. Rise up like family. Let the white man streak. Let the white man use pills. Let the white man go dirty and naked like he used to live in the caves. But you come on up, black man. It's time for the black family to survive. Thank you for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let's hear it. Minister Louis Farrakhan. Long live Muhammad. Long live Muhammad.